The stillness of the New Mexico desert was shattered by the most momentous explosion of all time. Military weapons dependent upon nuclear energy were now an inescapable reality. July 16th, 1945. While nearby communities sleep in peace, an eerie darkness blankets the New Mexico desert as a group of highly secretive scientists prepare for one of the most important tests humanity has ever attempted. This was the fiery birth of the atomic bomb. The desert ignites with a blinding light as the Trinity nuclear test unleashes a searing blast. 10,000 times hotter than the sun's surface, the unprecedented explosion heralds a radical new era Humanity has unlocked the power of the atom. The dawn of a new age and an engineering marvel that promised to reshape the world. It was a symbol of American prowess and a defiant display of strength against a looming threat. Yet beneath the surface of this triumph, a darker narrative was taking shape. A story far more complex than the facade of pure heroism and achievement. Forty miles away, a group of young girls slept soundly in their bunks, unaware that a new age had begun and their unexpected role in it. Alamogordo, a dramatic experiment, the most closely guarded secret in scientific history. In the quiet early morning hours, 13-year-old Barbara Kent and the rest of the girls slept soundly at Carmadine's dance camp near Rosidio, New Mexico just miles from the Alamogordo bomb range, soon to be ground zero. Their dreams were filled with ballet and tap dance routines, oblivious to the monumental events soon to shake their world. At 5.30 a.m., the earth jolted violently, sending some of the girls tumbling from their bunks. The counselors rushed to gather the startled campers as the cabin walls trembled around them. Venturing outside where they assumed it to be safer, the sky burned with a blinding, unearthly glow that hurt to look at. The distant rumbling faded, yet a dark uncertainty lingered in the air. In the wake of the explosion, a heavy silence fell across the land. Birds stopped chirping, and livestock grew still, as if sensing some invisible change in the air. Shaken but resilient, the counselors calmed the girls, convincing them that it was just a water heater explosion they should go about their normal morning routines. Little did they know that history had just been made. In the hours that followed, a mysterious fluffy residue began fluttering down from above. The camp's initial confusion as to what the substance was gave way to excitement. It was snowing in July. The girls playfully caught the warm flakes, assuming of course snow in July would be warm. They knew no better. They gleefully played in the nuclear fallout, rubbing it on their skin and swimming in contaminated waters. Unaware of the danger, they basked in the magic of summer snow. Outside the camp's cheerful bubble, livestock fell ill and chickens dropped dead. Farmers 30 miles north of the blast site awoke to find strange burns on their cattle. No one knew why. The fallout rained for days. The Trinity Blast's impacts extended far beyond Ground Zero. Manhattan Project scientist James Nolan grasped the potential threat facing civilians nearby before the test took place. Since this data showed over 500,000 people lived within 150 miles, some a mere 12 miles away. Compelled to act, Nolan urged General Groves to evacuate those in harm's way, but Groves feared a mass evacuation would draw unwanted attention from the press and expose the operation to enemies. Groves brushed his concerns off. Even the scientists underestimated the test's magnitude. They predicted a 12,000-foot-high blast, but were astonished upon detonation when the mushroom clouds surged to between 50,000 and 70,000 feet high. Only three of the 13 pounds of plutonium the bomb contained actually underwent fission. The remainder was set free into the atmosphere. Radioactive particles billowed upwards, latching onto debris. Another scientist, Stafford Warren, also expressed his concerns, writing to General Groves five days after the explosion. There is still a tremendous quantity of radioactive dust floating in the air. A very serious radiation hazard existed. Prevailing winds swept the enormous fallout cloud across the nation. The veil of secrecy had contained the blast, but could not confine the lingering effects now drifting silently over innocent towns. 
In the weeks following the Trinity test, reports of mysterious film defects began reaching the Eastman Kodak Company headquarters in Rochester, New York. Kodak produced, among other things, X-ray film used by companies and hospitals across America. But now, once pristine film was being ruined by tiny black specks and fogging, Kodak prided itself on its quality control, but tracing the source of the flaws left their scientists baffled. Earlier cases of similar fogging had been linked to radium contamination in packaging materials. Because of this risk, Kodak was now producing all of its own packaging. Yet tests showed no signs of radium exposure. In August 1945, a startling discovery was made. Kodak physicist Julian Webb examined packaging from a batch of ruined film dated August 6th, a few weeks after the Trinity explosion. The packaging was produced in a plant located in Indiana, and while Webb definitely found radiation, the source matched no known radioactive material. He later found identical isotopes contaminating their Iowa plant 450 miles away. Later tests confirmed the contaminant as cerium-141, a fission byproduct common in fallout debris. Webb knew Kodak's production pipeline inside and out. He concluded the source of contamination did not come from within Kodak. The source was rainwater flowing from the local river into Kodak's Indiana plant. With each rainfall, more radioactive residues spread. An envelope was dispatched to General Leslie Groves containing fogged film scans from Rochester. It was an early warning that Trinity's fallout had reached far beyond New Mexico. An atomic bomb. By 1951, contamination from ongoing nuclear testing forced Kodak to threaten legal action against the government. But a compromise was brokered in exchange for Kodak's silence. The military would provide advance notice before any future tests. The public, meanwhile, was never informed as testing continued for decades. In the days following the mysterious blast, a tense uncertainty hung over local communities near Ground Zero. Though the searing light had long faded, an invisible threat still swirled in the air and dust. Locals had begun noticing sick animals and crops. They were called feeling like the world was ending that fateful night, and while it might not have, they were left with more questions than answers. All the while, everything locals were eating or drinking in 1945 after the test was contaminated, but they did not know it. The day after the blast, the government arranged public forums to reassure rattled residents. The camp instructor took Barbara Kent and her campmates to attend one such gathering in Ruidoso's town square. Officials claimed the explosion came from a local dump site, a harmless accident. No one worry about anything, everything is fine, they insisted. But their words rang hollow for Barbara. Some of the locals believed it, while others found it absurd that a dump could cause such a tremendous sight. It would be years before they learned the whole truth. The girls from Carmadine's dance camp parted ways, returning home with fantastic tales of summer snow. Barbara went back to Texas, still perplexed by the strange events. When news broke of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, the true nature of the New Mexico explosion suddenly dawned on many locals. The mysterious blast had not been a mere dump accident. It was something far more monumental, a successful test of a terrifying new weapon. In the aftermath, government monitors quietly surveyed the region surrounding Ground Zero, but their low-tech instruments and limited efforts painted an incomplete picture. Fallout measurements taken after the explosion were very limited, noted a 2019 bulletin of the Atomic Scientists report. The doctors of the Manhattan Project suspected area civilians had been overexposed to radiation, yet proof was scarce. As project physician Dr. Lewis Hempelman later admitted, they couldn't prove it and we couldn't prove it, so we just assumed that we'd gotten away with it. While the U.S. established the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission to study survivors in Japan, no such efforts were made for those affected by the Trinity test on American soil. For officials, the absence of provable harm allowed them to proceed full steam with further nuclear development. But for ordinary citizens, the consequences of their uninformed radiation exposure would emerge in devastating ways for years to come. 
Illness and cancer clusters were chalked up to bad luck rather than connected to that pivotal summer morning. A local healthcare provider, Catherine Banky, wrote to Stafford Warren at Los Alamos, the same scientist who had warned of a very serious radiation hazard. She expressed her concerns at the alarming infant mortality rate that August in 1945. Their small community alone had lost 35 infants that month. He responded by telling her he had heard of no such increase and that he wanted to assure her that the safety and health of the public at large is not in any way endangered. In the years after that fateful summer, Barbara Kent watched as one by one, all 11 fellow campers, plus her mother and the camp director, succumbed to various cancers and disease, a staggering toll from just one small group's exposure. Though the U.S. government eventually acknowledged nuclear harms through the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, restitution remains incomplete. Downwinders of those first tests outside the immediate blast zone are ineligible to this day. Cold War calculus valued secrecy over innocence, and nearly eight decades later, the full impacts of Trinity remain unknown. How many more lived shortened lives chalked up to bad luck rather than the consequences of an awakened atomic age? Their stories echo into today as we wrestle with technologies that offer both progress and peril. What lessons does the first atomic morning hold for navigating that divide? Barbara Kent continues searching for answers and justice for forgotten downwinders, but no longer standing under the dark shadows cast by that blinding light in the New Mexico sky. 